Lord, to whom should we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness of God's infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with palms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the canvases of earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend a knee, 
and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For his for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. A reading from Genesis. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was gracious and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife so that I may go in to her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people from the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Laban gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, and Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. The word of the Lord. Portions of Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name that the hearts of those who seek the Lord and rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful work he has done, his miracles and the judgment he uttered. The offspring of his servant Abraham children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord, our God. His judgments are all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded and for a thousand generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham is sworn spouse to Isaac, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue to Israel on everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. A reading from the book of Romans. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he first knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, Will he not be, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come my way my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone had sowed into the field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate out the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. He then asked them, have you understood this? And they answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A scout is never taken by surprise. He knows exactly what to do when anything unexpected happens. So said Robert Baden-Powell, the British Army officer and, of course, founder of the Boy Scouts. No argument. It's good to be prepared. That's a great motto. But I'm not so sure I want to live a life fully without surprises because although they can be dangerous, they can be delightful too. The parables Jesus told in our gospel reading today are full of surprises. The smallest seed becomes the largest plant. A small amount of yeast leavens the whole loaf. Someone finds a treasure in a field and someone else a pearl of great price. And finally, a net thrown into the sea has astounding success, catching not just a few fish, but every kind of fish. Each story is a little different, emphasizing various truths about the kingdom of heaven. But each story has an element of surprise, a sense of hiddenness, the joy of discovery. So while these five parables of Jesus come in a, a rapid fire fashion in these shoot, a few short verses, they do have a common thread. The kingdom of heaven is surprising. Or even as a song from uh, many that our childhoods would remember uh, proclaimed, God is a surprise. Now it shouldn't, I guess I'll use that word again, surprise us that these parables have such a theme. In a way, all parables say something unexpected. In his book, Preaching Parables to Postmoderns, Brian C. Stiller points out that the Greek word we translate parable means literally to speak, quote, otherwise than one seems to speak. And so the prodigal son is shockingly forgiven. The hated Samaritan turns out to be the good guy. The man forgiven a great debt turns around and refuses to forgive someone else a much smaller debt. And the rich, successful man has his life cut short. We talk about Jesus as a great teacher. And part of that great teaching was that he was a fantastic storyteller, too. And since his subject is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew's gospel always puts it, these parables invite our full attention, invite us to listen, understand, and to act. In today's parables, Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven, in other words, the way uh, the world would be if we all lived the way Jesus lived, is so valuable that it eclipses everything else. 
that we are to prize God's ways, just as the person who sold everything for the sake of the one treasure and for the person who sold it all for a single pearl. Now we may think that's a challenge. Do we work that hard for and in God's kingdom? Well, maybe in our best moments, but surely not all the time. And so today's parables may make us feel a little discouraged, maybe even guilty. That is, were it not for one word, surprise. And the surprise, the encouraging, relieving surprise in these parables is this. God grows his own kingdom. Yes, we cooperate. And yes, we are called to serve others and to work to realize God's ways on earth because of our love for Christ. But in each parable, God is the one making things happen. The mustard seed does not grow because of human effort. The yeast does not work because the woman willed it to do so. The treasure and the pearl are so valued and attractive in and of themselves that that decision to give up everything else to have them is an easy one. And while, yes, fishers cast, net, cast the nets, uh, they can't make those nets fill up at will, can't go calling here fishy, 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 and expect results. Other forces and other factors are always at work. Well, if parables call us to listen, to understand, and to act, I hope at this point we've listened and understood at least a little. But how do we act? If God is the one at work, what are we supposed to do? And if the kingdom is at all like these things that are hidden, where are we supposed to look in order to find it? Let's deal with those questions in reverse order. Where do we look to discover this kingdom? When we look at the world, we may logically and reasonably conclude that God's kingdom must be hidden very deeply indeed. Yes, the lake is gorgeous. And yes, the laugh of a little baby can warm even the coldest heart. It's easy if our eyes are open to see God at work in the little stuff. But what about the big stuff? How can the kingdom of heaven be found in a pandemic? Surely it must be absent or at least deeply hidden. The kingdom of God can feel absent, I think we must admit. And yet Jesus still whispers, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It'll quickly become big and provide shelter. The kingdom of heaven is not absent. And although it is hidden, it is discoverable. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote about these parables in her book, The Seeds of Heaven. She's one of my favorite preachers and authors. When I'm reflecting on how and where we should look for God's kingdom, especially given the darkness of this world, Barbara Brown Taylor wrote this. It seems like we ought to start someplace really holy, someplace really extraordinary, like a medieval monastery maybe, or in the Holy Land, or at the Vatican. Unless, of course, God has resorted to the oldest trick in the book and hidden his kingdom in plain view. Why else would Jesus talk about heaven in terms of farmers and fields and women breaking bread and merchants and buying and selling and fishermen sorting fish, all the ordinary people and places and activities of our lives. Well, we may in times of discouragement come to believe that as Barbara Brown Taylor also wrote, if the kingdom of heaven is hidden in this world, it is hidden really well. But by using earthly words, Jesus' parables remind us that earth is, again as she wrote, where the kingdom, where the uh, souls where the seeds of heaven are sown. So where should we look for the kingdom? Everywhere. And now to that first question as we consider our response to today's gospel. Besides looking everywhere and keeping our eyes open in the ordinary, what should we do? Well, the answer to this, I believe, comes in the final two verses uh, of our gospel reading. Let's hear them again. Jesus said to his disciples, have you understood all this? They answered, yes. Okay, so they got that. They got the understanding. So what are they to do? And uh, Jesus says to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household 
who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now I had to do some extra digging to figure out what this means. And here's what I learned. Jesus is saying that having heard and understood his parables about the kingdom, his disciples are now to become teachers. A scribe was someone trained to teach the law. In calling his followers scribes of the kingdom, he is telling them that they are trained to teach these truths of the kingdom of heaven to others. And they're not to leave anything out. They are to teach both Israel's history and how Jesus' kingdom age fulfills it. To teach just like, uh, and I'm quoting here, a master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Again, from that end of Matthew's, uh, of this, today's gospel. And so if we have listened to and understood the parables, Jesus says, don't keep it to yourself. Become the teachers. Well, we may not feel up to the rule of the scribe, but I suspect those first disciples didn't either. And neither they nor we are left alone in this task. God is building his kingdom. Christ has taught us, and the Holy Spirit continues to empower us to hear, understand, and then even to teach this surprising kingdom to a world already holding its seeds. And the kingdom's lessons and God's ways are everywhere. We can hear a lot of bad news lately. Listen for the good, listen for the seeds of the kingdom. How can we share what we have been taught by our Lord and Savior? Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open up your eyes and see. We now share in our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for a day of fulfillment and peace. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to teach to love others as we have been loved. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for peace and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen and relieve those who are in need. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to renew the church through the power of his life-giving spirit. Lord, have mercy. A prayer for strength. Eternal God, you create us by your own power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us through your spirit that we may give ourselves today in love and service to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in prayer at the collect appointed for today. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>